Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great that uh, you're all out over here. I presume uh, you've had a very decent lunch and you're all settled now for some fascinating conversation. Uh, it is fascinating because it's a part of our history which is not really covered enough. It's not spoken about enough. Um, the Second World War, whether it's uh, the Second World War as a, a broader topic or the role of India in the Second World War, the broader of the role of Indian citizens or Indians in the Second World War. They weren't Indian citizens, but the idea of India certainly preceded uh, the Second World War itself. Um, it is tragic that um, the role of Indian soldiers and the role of Indian civilians during that period, specific to the war, has not been covered enough in our textbooks, in our college uh, syllabus. Um, it, for, for decades altogether, there was a very deliberate effort at downplaying the role of, of Indians in the Great Wars. And the fact is that we've lost um, uh, nearly two lakh people across the First and the Second World War in terms of casualties and the stories um, are, uh, are, are something which really do need to be told. The modern Indian armed forces are in a sense, I mean, directly linked to their colonial predecessors. And so that's what the tradition of the modern Indian army is all about. Um, my own interest in this topic is uh, about 15 years ago when I decided to do a documentary series on the role of Indian soldiers in the Second World War. It was called Great Battles. We aired it on NDTV, where I was lucky enough to travel the world uh, to uh, areas where the Commonwealth uh, War Graves Association maintained the memory of Indian soldiers killed, whether in North Africa, in East Africa, across Europe, and in, in, in the east of India as well, Kohima and Imphal specifically. Uh, and the stories are remarkable stories. Uh, and it is tragic that the footage of that war, which was voluminous and existed in India for decades, was not shared with people across the country. It wasn't shared at all. The footage actually lay with the Armed Forces Films and Photo Division in the same building block where the Langurs were kept and continue to be kept outside South Block. Whenever there is a, a larger monkey or a smaller monkey, a Langur is deployed. Whenever there are foreign dignitaries, a Langur is deployed. In that same block, we had the most wonderful archival treasures, which we were able to actually get hold of and put together this series. But that's another story. I think it's wonderful that Jaipur is, uh, the Jaipur Lit Fest is focusing on these two books, The Great Flap of 1942 by Mukund Padmanabhan and His Majesty's Headhunters, The Siege of Kohima that Shaped World History by Monlumo Kikon. Um, both remarkable books, very different, but full of stories. And these are stories which haven't been told. Mukund focuses to a large extent on the evacuation of our cities and the sense of fear and uncertainty ahead of what people thought would be a full-fledged Japanese invasion of all of India. As it turns out, that never took place. But the stories of people actually leaving en masse from places like Chennai, where his mother uh, used to live and um, other areas is something that does need to be told and we're going to be talking to him about that. Monlumo has written this remarkable book on one of the most fierce tribes or, uh, or people of India, the Nagas. The modern-day Naga Regiment of the Indian Army is known for its valor, it's known for its grit, it's known for its Dao, and they call themselves the Headhunters. Now, this is not just some sort of popular uh, name, the Headhunters, which sounds kind of cool. They're called the Headhunters because that's what they've traditionally done. They've cut heads. Um, and that's the way they fought. And that is how they became an essential part of the war against the Japanese when the Japanese did actually come to our eastern frontier, the Nagas cut off their heads and were in a sense an invaluable part of the British as they fought off the threat of the Japanese in the northeast of our country. But having said far too much, let me start by going across to Mukund. Tell us about the sense of fear that existed ahead of what was thought to be Japan's big invasion of India. Yeah, um, well, when I began the book, um, I was aware that there was uh, a sort of wholesome exodus uh, from Madras. Uh, but as I continued to research it, um, uh, I found that uh, pretty much all of India was in a panic. And uh, people fled from the unlikeliest places. And also the, that the extent of the exodus was, hasn't been properly mapped. Uh, so. 
I think conservatively, 75% of Madras fled, but I think there's a very, very strong case for believing that almost 90% left. Um, and the city was absolutely empty and deserted. Uh, Vizag emptied out. Uh, we know some other places emptied out on the coast. But the interesting thing is that places inland, uh, there was an exodus from places like Bombay. 25% of Bombay fled, even though it was on the west coast and very far away from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, which the Japanese had conquered. Um, and also unlikely places uh, which, uh, such as uh, Ahmedabad and, and uh, you know, uh, Kode Canal, uh, pretty much all over South India, Hyderabad, Bangalore. Uh, so the, the, the exodus uh, that happened was basically unmapped and so was the panic. And I think this is a result of the interest that both uh, colonial and uh, Indian historians had on the period, uh, and also a function of the fact that the Japanese never invaded, so they thought it was a non-story. So what I'm trying to do is saying they may not have come, uh, but there's quite a bit that happened that deserves to be historically mapped. There was that story of your uh, mother's house having been ransacked when she eventually yeah. came back? Well, my, mother, my mother's family left rather late. Um, you know, people started fleeing uh, pretty soon after the Japan attacked Malaya, which uh, they attacked synchronously with Pearl Harbor, which was December, early December 1941. Uh, my mother's family, my mother remembers her family went late, so they decided to stay put. Uh, but suddenly, apparently, the milkmen stopped coming. And then, you know, that made life in the city pretty hard. How do you live without milk? There was already a scarcity of other, other materials. And when she came back a year later, um, like many other houses in Madras, they were just empty, ruinous shells because uh, thieves had just a run of the day. You know, people have just left their houses, watchmen have fled. I mean, they appointed a watchman who fled. Uh, so uh, there, was, uh, there was that kind of thing that happened uh, pretty much all over the city. Yeah. So what we're doing in this conversation is flitting between two time periods. What uh, Mukund is talking about is what, 1942-ish, right? 19, to late start 1941 with this part of our conversation. Yeah. And the Battle of Kohima was 1944, right? So let me come uh, to Mionlumo next. And uh, what he writes is interesting. One of the great Japanese generals, one of the greatest in their imperial history was Lieutenant General Sato, who actually fought um, on that front. And this is a quote from his book, uh, Monlumo's book. Lieutenant General Sato is said to have commented that if it were not for the Nagas, the Allied forces would have eventually been defeated in Kohima and the Japanese army could have easily secured the Dimapur railway station and triumphantly moved towards Bengal via Assam, thus reversing the course of world history. That's remarkable. This is what one of uh, Japan's key generals actually said uh, about the role of Nagas. So in as much as we talk about the Allies defeating the British or the British, I, I beg your pardon, the Allies defeating the Japanese or the, the British defeating the Japanese, it was the significant role of the Nagas which has never been spoken about until this book came about in quite this way. What was that role in the war, in the Battle of Kohima? Thank you so much. We'll have to go back to uh, the First World War, where uh, the Nagas were taken as laborers to, uh, in the labor corp to France for the sec uh, First World War. And then later on, uh, just prior to the Second World War, in 1941, there was a, a big, massive enlistment of uh, not just the Nagas, but uh, communities around Northeast, what we now call Northeast, for the labor corps. So uh, I'll just... Uh, tell you about why I wrote and how I got interested in this uh, uh, particular aspect of our history. My grandfather was in the labor corps, so he, I used to go and uh, meet him in the village and he used to tell me how he went to Burma and how he built along with uh, you know, various other members of the labor corps the road to Tidim. Tidim now is in the Chin area of uh, Myanmar. So that road is where uh, the British decisively actually defeated the Japanese Imperial Army. So that's one of the story which uh, he kept telling me, and so I was curious. So when I read uh, books on the Second World War, most of them written by British authors and uh, British jo journalists, I realized that most of the books were uh, glorification of their exploits in the Battle of Koima and how, because of the Vela, because of uh, their superior organizing power, they were able to defeat the Japanese army. So, you know, right after the Pearl Harbor, the Japanese uh, Imperial Army had come over to uh, Burma, they have taken over and uh, they, they were actually uh, on the way to uh, uh, Dimapur. 
So Battle of Koima and Imphal happened around that time that Japanese Imperial Army was at its, uh, let us say, at its peak. And the British Empire was on the wane. So, you know, uh, if you read history written by Americans, they, they would also, you know, point out that it's because of their uh, air force, the uh, air, air power that actually helped the British win uh, the Battle of Koima, which is called a decisive bat battle by the British themselves. In fact, the British uh, National Army Museum had uh, considered the Battle of Koima as the greatest, Britain's greatest war or victory. So, I mean, in their category, this is the, their greatest war. But the fact is that in all their accounts, none of the support given by the locals were uh, sufficiently mentioned. And I feel that that is uh, uh, something which they missed out uh, because maybe uh, they didn't want to put it in their colonial history. And that is something which is for the natives to write about. So I felt that we should investigate and bring out a story from the narrative of the natives. So that's how I got into, uh, interested into this book. And I also mentioned that, you know, in the book, there's a earlier sec section is uh, on the colonial conquest or the history in the Naga Hills, how the British India Company came in contact with the Nagas and how the entire uh, 100 years it took to actually set up, set up a political administ administrative headquarter there. In fact, uh, as we were con uh, discussing, even the, I mean, British were, the British officers of the British Empire were very bad at pronouncing local names. I mean, it's, I think that's the case with the rest of India as well. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, the word Kohima was, uh, you know, corruption of the word Kehima. So it was not even there. But, you know, how they named uh, a place, uh, actually it was just, uh, you know, they just had 20 odd houses to house, uh, it's a garrison of the British uh, uh, Empire, and uh, it was surrounded by a host of villages. How that particular spot, misnamed or mispronounced by the British, became the site of the greatest battle ever for the British Empire. No, absolutely, and when he, you know, he talks about the Battle of Kohima, we, we've, we've all seen films, for example, uh, Enemy at the Doorstep, or we've, we've read about the Battle of uh, Stalingrad, the Normandy landings, some of the other great battles, the Battle of Monte Cassino, it's widely believed, or, or the battle of, or, or some of the great battles in El Alamein, it is widely believed that the Battle of Kohima, in, in what is <laughs> right in a part of our country, is one of the most horrific, difficult uh, military battles in the history of warfare, and perhaps the single greatest battle fought in the Second World War. It's just not talk, uh, spoken about in quite the same way. But let me jump to a few years back once again as I go back and forth. Um, you also write, Mukund, a great deal about the role of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Uh, the fact that um, they were very heavily deployed. In fact, I find something quite interesting. You mention um, how waves of aircraft bombed Colombo and a few days later, the port town of Trincomalee, these were uh, warships uh, which were bombing. These were Japanese planes which were bombing, some deployed of their aircraft carriers. Off Ceylon's eastern coast, the venerable British aircraft carrier Hermes and its companion the destroyer Vampire was sunk, killing over 300 men. I find the name Hermes interesting because Hermes became, in its second avatar, the Hermes which won the British, the Falkland Islands War, it then was sold to India as INS Virat. So this uh, was the original Hermes. But how did uh, the naval battles of um, the Japanese actually fuel the fear that you've written about? So I just want to make uh, uh, a point going back to what Kikon said, and I'm going to differ with him very, very slightly on, you know, on his fascinating introduction. Uh, the period I talk about is when Japan was ascendant. Yes. Okay, they didn't lose a battle. Yes. There's no battle that they lost. They went into Malaya, they, they took the Dutch Indies. The British didn't win a thing. They lost everything. They surrendered Singapore. The, in 42, two events take place that actually virtually cripple Japan as a kind of naval power, which is the Battle of Midway and the Battle of Coral Sea. And uh, so, with due respect, um, the Japan couldn't have had those, the same kind of imperial ambitions after that. Uh, they were weakened considerably by the Battle of Kohima. And despite the resistance and everything else, uh, 
you know, I think the British had armed themselves uh, by 45, I think, and General Slim was able to, you know, push back uh, fairly easily, um, despite some resistance into it. And I'm not denying the importance of the battle or the savage, savage cause. But in 42, they were a force that, you know, even Churchill, who mentions the Indian, saying it's the most dangerous moment in the war, he calls it. Uh, you know, not, not, not Europe, but this. And this is when Nagumo, who is the hero of Pearl Harbor, sails with a fleet of, I can't remember, maybe six aircraft carriers into, uh, into the Bay of Bengal, looking for the British Eastern Fleet, which was based in Singapore. Singapore had fallen. Uh, so they moved to Trincomalee. And, and they're looking to take down the British Naval Fleet. But fortuitously, rather like Pearl Harbor when some aircraft carriers were away, uh, Somerville, who headed the Eastern Fleet, had taken uh, a part of his fleet to the Maldives, in a place called Adu Atoll, yep. which was unknown to the Japanese as a base. So essentially what they do is they bomb Colombo, they bomb the 300 planes, it's not a small operation, they bomb Trincomalee, they take down the Hermes, they take down other ships, um, and they leave. Uh, and at the same time, there's another fleet, a smaller fleet, uh, led by a man called Azama, which is just merrily picking off merchant ships in the uh, Bay of Bengal, just shooting people over two days at random. And these stories haven't been, um, you know, the merchant stories haven't been fully told. I mean, sometimes we talk about the bombing in Vishakhapatnam and Kakinada that we know about. Uh, but the merchant ship story, I find, uh, hasn't got the importance it, 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 it deserved because many, many ships were sunk, many people were killed, and there were a whole lot of survivors who were washed up uh, to the shore at that time. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, uh, they came close, and uh, when they came close to India, um, it frightened India a lot more. And this is when Cripps was here, by the way. Uh, we'll talk about Cripps in a moment, but I'm going to jump to your story, back to your story. I think one of the most fascinating parts of your book is your entire description of the fighting culture of the Nagas. I'm going to read out a couple of, uh, a couple of bits uh, and then ask you to talk about it. You write, on the question being once put to the Nagas, whether they would like to become the subjects of the company, they promptly replied, no, we could not then cut off the heads of men and attain renown as warriors, bearing the honorable marks of our valor on our bodies and our faces. Um, decapitating with the right blow of the Dao, right, or headhunting was the most significant art of warfare practiced by Nagas from the ancient times right up till 1994, right? So could you tell us a little bit about this culture? Um, it was about tribal honor, right? It still is in a sense, though that's not allowed anymore, uh, last I heard. So, I mean, I'll uh, put in a disclaimer first. I'm not a headhunter, so you don't have to be scared <laughs> of me. <laughs> but I, I just uh, would like to uh, share one story about a friend of mine who died in the Kargil War. He's the only Naga to have uh, received the Mahavir Chakra. So it's like, uh, according to Vishnu Som, is the second highest uh, wartime uh, wa uh, gallantry, award. gallantry award. So he died in the Dras sector. So he was the captain of the... Khattak platoon. So they were tasked with uh, capturing that Lone Hill there. And um, they decided that because they could, the Indian Army could not proceed beyond that. And it's like 16,000 feet of uh, minus 10 degree uh, you know, uh, area hill. So in the night, he went up and uh, there was some uh, uh, fight with a gun. But ultimately, he used his uh, bare hands and the kukri. So kukri is like a smaller version of uh, our traditional dao, which we use for war. So he used that to actually go and, you know, just capture the hill. So in the process, he was shot in the abdomen and he died and he won the Mahavir Chakra. But he was only 24 years. He was a friend of mine. So it kept me thinking because in 1994, it was a very sporadic, isolated, even in the cornermost part of Nagaland bordering Myanmar where two villages fought with the Dao, cutting the head of each other. So that was the, after a very long time, a uh, rare incident occurred of headhunting uh, in the Naga Hills. But, you know, I felt that because it is in our animistic tradition and culture that for a man, a rite of passage is the taking of heads. Unless you take the heads of another, uh, of an enemy head, 
you will not be allowed to get married. And this was like practice, uh, you know, from 19th century backwards. So I would say that that was part of our culture then. And because of the advent of Christianity and all these practices stopped, we no longer are. But if you look at the uh, preferred choice of battle that our army officer took, it was with a hand. And um, I would like to quote uh, the former chief minister of uh, Chhattisgarh, Mr. Raman Singh, who said, because that time uh, the, the, the uh, menace of Maoism was at its height in Chhattisgarh, especially in Bastar region. And they had engaged the uh, uh, Indian Reserve Battalion from Nagaland. So these Nagaland armed forces went there and they were uh, utilized for the jungle warfare. The comment or the observation of the, both the police establishment and Raman Singh was that, the Nagas are the best in jungle warfare because they can eat anything and live off anything in the jungle for the longest period of time and they can climb any mountains. Their trekking uh, you know, uh, capacity is uh, excellent and in the, the way they attack the Maoist in the battles there was you know, not just uh, any battle, but it was terrifying for the Maoists to face the Nagas. So, I mean, in his comment, it makes me realize because, you know, most of the Naga soldiers, although they were given sophisticated weapons, they were airdropped by choppers in the Buster, the hills of Buster, which is very thick, they still brought their Tao along with them in the battle. So I think that in a sense, you know, when you decapitate a head, it is believed that the spirit of the, or the soul of the person is, lies in the head. So unless you decapitate the head, you will not have a decisive control or victory over that enemy. And that was a practice. And in the past, they used to hang the heads on their, uh, you know... Uh, Spears. Yeah, with a spear. Yeah. Spear and dao, actually. Scary stuff, huh? <coughs> uh, we need to be a bit careful of him after this session. You know, he's rather uh, impassioned at this stage. You know, Mukund actually speaks uh, in his book about the terrain that uh, the British and the Japanese operated in as they went up the Malay Peninsula past Singapore uh, into what is now Myanmar, Burma then, and eventually uh, onto India's northeast. And as we visualize in this conversation uh, what exactly we are talking about, I think it's important to talk about the terrain as well. And I'll ask Mukund to do that. So he talks about geography a rainforested mountain range about 650 kilometers from north to south ran like a thick green spine down the middle of the peninsula. Streams that grew into swiftly flowing rivers emerged in it like tendrils that emptied out on both sides. The Straits of Malacca on the east and the South China Sea westwards. The coastal plains were made up uh, of a mix. The conquest of Malay Malaya of mudflats, sandy beaches, mangrove forests, throw in jungle swamps, rainfall, Venomous snakes, and that's what they were fighting in. How was geography such an important aspect in uh, in the eventual defeat of the Japanese? Well, I mean, uh, this this is quoted from the chapter on Malaya. And so yeah. what happened is British traditionally thought if there was a threat, it would come from the northeast because of Japan and China, or there would be a threat from the other side, the northwest, you know, Afghanistan, that way. Uh, it wasn't anticipated that the threat would come from Southeast Asia. So also, nobody at that time expected the Japanese to land in the north of Malaya and actually make their way down. Because the moment they landed there uh, at Kota Baru, which was the first place, uh, if you look at the literature at that time, it was like, hey, uh, they can't make their way down. But they used bicycles. Um, and uh, they had this thing called the Bicycle Blitzkrieg. And they they defied geography in a way in, 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 in coming down the spine of Malaya. And as you know, there's this fabled story, I think it's not entirely true, that Singapore's guns were basically faced the wrong way. Yeah. They were not faced north, which is true. Many of them were faced, some of them faced north as well. I mean, it's not really true that everything was facing towards the sea. But uh, the kind of guns that they had were, were not effective, you know, against an army coming in. So, um, in effect, they were not prepared at all for a siege of Singapore, which was the most important base uh, that they had. 
because the British kept telling Indians and telling the world that as long as they had Singapore, there was nothing to worry. And then Singapore collapsed. Uh, you know, when you're talking about the, Singapore, the collapse of Singapore, there was the evacuation of Singapore as well. There was the evacuation of Penang as well. Yeah. And I picked out a bit over here where uh, you write, Asiatics were not allowed to leave by the same boats as, uh, as the Westerners, uh, not even women and children, describing it as disgraceful. He added, um, you're talking about one of the evacuees. I do not think the British people will ever live it down. Um, at the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry of Fiki meeting in Delhi, Rajbali Jumabhoy, president of the Singapore chapter, pointed out that no Indian was allowed to leave after Penang suddenly fell into Japanese hands. So even the evacuation was, was racist. Yeah. So, so in Penang, uh, which had a large uh, European population, the Japanese came in and bombed. And at one point, the entire white population of Penang fled, uh, organized. And then they were put on trains and sent to, um, uh, to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and the rest of the population wasn't informed that they were going to go. Uh, there is, of course, some controversy on whether, you know, the white population were ordered to go or not. But irrespective of that, it was a pretty, uh, not to put too fine a point of it, uh, a sort of almost a racial, a racial evacuation. And I think Chris Bailey, the great Cambridge historian who's written on this, I can't remember the exact quote, but he's quoted there. He suggests that it was Britain's most shameful moment in the war. Yeah. After... Uh, Penang fell into Japanese hands. There was no one to defend Penang. So the army had moved out. They just moved in. Um, there was this issue of sending people back from Singapore and Malaya. And uh, there is enough, enough evidence to suggest that, um, you know, there were white people were evacuated. Uh, and uh, it was more difficult for Indians to get on board. And there was a controversy over this raised in the Central Assembly. Uh, Lin Lithgow himself, who mm. was Viceroy of India, felt and deferred with Amory that he felt that there was racial discrimination in this. So I think there was. There was some. One more question to you. Even before in the evacuation from Burma. Sure. Yeah. One more question to you before I go back to Mon Um The Scripps mission, which was uh, very much a factor in 1944 onwards. Two. Uh, yeah. 1942 onwards. It became, um, what ultimately came off the Scripps mission was directly linked to fears of what the Japanese might do to India, right? Well, I'm Glad you asked that question because most historians uh, deal with Crips uh, by dealing with the formal substance of his offer. Here's what is offered. This is not good enough. Here's a counter offer. Maybe that's not good enough too. This is what we want. And finally, the whole negotiations break down on whether you could have uh, the equivalent of an Indian defense minister yeah. in the cabinet. Uh, this, is the, this is the sort of main story. Uh, but I think... At the very least, Crips, the mission and its failure needs to be examined against the light of what was happening in India. Crips was in India when Vishakhapatnam was bombed, Kakinada was bombed, Colombo was bombed, Trincomalee was bombed, uh, the Bay of Bengal operations, uh, you know, the sinking of merchant ships was happening. Uh, when the Andaman Islands were taken and, and you know, when more, most over. of yeah. South Asia fell. And uh, to suggest that none of this had an impact on the... Uh, uh, the outcome, I find hard to accept. I mean, Gandhi, for instance, was opposed to Crips right from the very beginning because he didn't want India to be dragged into... He, didn't, he felt that India's support for the war, which is what Crips sought, uh, would involve, uh, you know, fighting an immoral battle because he was against any form of violence. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a case for looking at Crips against this context at the very least. And I do not think you can deny that uh, the Crips mission or Gandhi's radicalization, which finally led to the Quit India Call in 42, that it had nothing to do with uh, the events of this period. Now, it's hard to establish this conclusively that, you know, what exactly the impact was. But to write about it in a vacuum, I find uh, problematic. Monlubo, um, you know, we've spoken about uh, the Naga community being a part of the British resistance. But the British uh, winning over the Naga community, uh, often by force, uh, in your book, you've, if I recall correctly, you've said was what took them 46 years, but in effect, it was a lifetime for who, those who were involved in it. How difficult, Mullumo, was that uh, was that challenge? 
I mean, there was the usual methodology of uh, burning down villages, killing the warriors, arresting them on false charges. And this happened over a period of 46 years because they took 46 years to actually come and uh, uh, establish a political headquarter in a place now called Kohima. Uh, any one of you who've been to Kohima would know that the greatest, uh, biggest landmark in Kohima is the World War II memorial there, where everybody uh, is fond of quoting the epitaph. But, uh, you know, the history behind it is that that was the battleground. And on, uh, upon the battleground, when Kohima was raised to the ground with bombs and uh, the war, war itself, uh, through mortars, you know, bombs and all that. So that is that part of history is a violent part of history. The British were not necessarily, the British Empire or the East India Company were not necessarily looking for, uh, uh, you know, es establishing a headquarters there. But they wanted to sort of survey a road from Imphal to uh, Dimapur to Kachar Hills. And um, it's now called the Asian Highway 1 or the National Highway 2. But the initial attempt was that in 1832. So from 1832 to look at 1944, so almost uh, more than a century, you know. So it took them a long time. Um, I would, uh, you know, look at the Second World War, especially the Battle of Kohima. And before I do that, I'll just add one thing that, you know, if you look at the losses of the Japanese Imperial Army, more than 20% of the uh, uh, soldiers who died in the entire Second World War for the Japanese Imperial Army died in the Battle of Kohima and Imphal. Uh, and uh, statistics are there to show that. So it's, it's a, a big war for them and a big loss for them. And how they lost it is because, you know, the, coming back to the question you asked, initially, there is uh, what we now like to term, because for uh, maybe India, it is not called uh, Anglo-Naga War. It cannot be called, uh, you know, the revolt of 1857 or uh, Battle of Plassey. But for the Nagas who died, because they were our ancestors, it's, uh, we call it the anglo Konoma War, named after the village which led the revolt against the British. And it was not always, you know, uh, negotiation. There were no, no negotiation because in the Naga art of warfare, there is no concept of surrender. Either you kill them or you get killed. So this was the principle on the basis of which warfare was waged. And entire villages was, were burned down by the British, uh, I mean, army. I think what we'd like to do uh, is move on to a couple of questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. So questions, please. And uh, not long sentences. Yes, sir. And then we'll... Uh, Just speak loudly. Uh, I might as well use my Parajong voice when <laughs> uh, I just uh, wanted to check out uh, the fact that uh, while you have spoken, both of you have spoken very eloquently about the fact that uh, there was a lot of uh, British involvement and all. Uh, coming back to you, sir, what about the Stillwell Road? Uh, did that also contribute towards the Nagaland uh, aspects and whether the reinforcements could come through the Stillwell Road uh, down to the... Uh, and uh, second question to you, Mr. Padnaman. Uh, whether uh, one, it, let's take one question okay. at a time. Yeah. The role of the steel well road. So the, the steel well road, I mean, if you look at the history of the warfare there, the Americans were interested in defeating the Japanese in China and the supporting Chiang kai uh, government. So for them to actually give uh, supply, you know, both ration and ammunition, they used the uh, valley of Upper Assam by you know, building airstrips. And, and then they, they saw that uh, the other way could be to make the steel well road from Ledo to Kunming. So that period was before actually the uh, entire Burma campaign started. So actually, if you look, if you go to a place, the oldest town in Arunachal called Pasiga, there is a uh, Air Force Museum where they have actually, you know, a lot of plane crash because the Americans trained their pilots for only three months and they were sent to fight in the war against the Japanese there. I mean, the irony is today, in, after 1962, the issue is with the China, not with Japan. But uh, if you look at that period, the Air Force or the American Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, they had to fly over that uh, eastern Himalayas called the, the hump, hump. as it were, yeah. It's called the Hump. So, I um, mean, even the museum is called the Hump Museum in <laughs> Pasigat. And they were actually, a lot of plane crashed. But it was that time where they thought that the military engineering service of the American Air Force had to be sent to actually uh, lay the railway lines. 
and also build the roads. So that definitely helped because it was an all-out war, not just in uh, Koima, but the theater was the entire South Asia, East Asia and uh, Japan and China. Yes, sir. Um, go ahead. We can hear hello, you. Hello. Um, so I wanted to ask Monlumo about um, whether you ever came across kind of during the war Naga regiments fighting with the British, fighting against Nagas in the Japanese army. So I w read about, uh, I can't remember where, that Angami Zabufizo, who's the lead kind of, you know, head of the Naga movement later, was fighting with the Japanese, which made me fascinated whether you came across, you know, divided families fighting in the war or anything like that. Uh, I, I wrote about it in my uh, book as well. I mentioned uh, because Pizzo at that time was an uh, insurance salesman in uh, Rangoon. And uh, that time the Japanese intelligence actually uh, contacted him with the help of uh, Subhas Chandra Bose uh, INA. And although Bose was not physically present or Pizzo was not physically present, people who supported their campaign and their spirit and their leadership was present in the Second World War. So they were, uh, you know, there was the Indian Army, National Army of Bose was around 50,000 soldiers that time or a little more or less. Uh, so they were present in Imphal and uh, Kohima, uh, a place called Kigwema, where General Sato was camped with the Japanese Imperial Army. So they actually sided with them. But initially, the because of, I mean, I was following uh, Vishnu's question. Because of 100 years of colonial, colonial, colonialization, the natives, the Nagas, actually sided with the British because there was an attempt of engagement for a very long time. So it was not just physical colonization. Sure. There was a man, uh, you know, colonization of the mindset. Sure. And uh, definitely there was division because of that. But that force which sided with the Japanese was minimal. And it couldn't, uh, uh, you know, it couldn't, I think they couldn't get enough support because the Japanese were short of resources and ration. They started att attacking Naga villages, stealing our livestock and our people were, you know, the, you know, simple people. They just look at what you see and they responded negatively and uh, against the Japanese Imperial Army. Do you have questions for Mukund, anyone? Raise your hands. Uh, sir, in the, uh, yes, please go ahead, sir. Uh, Mukund, you mentioned about the migration of, uh, from Indian cities in the east, inland. There's a very interesting Jaipur connection to this. Jaipur is synonymous with the late Rajmata Gayatri Devi, after whom the school is named. Her sister was married in trip to the Maharaja of Tripura's brother. The entire Tripura family during the Second World War left Tripura and came and settled down in my hometown, Panna, which is in Bundelkhand, in the wilds of badlands of Bundelkhand. So there is a Jaipur connection in the sense that the Gayatri Devi's own sister and her husband and her elder brother, who was the Maharaja, his elder brother. Right. They left So, sir, more here. of a comment over there. Would you like to add to that? Or yeah, uh, no, I just say absolutely true. I mean, the book does talk about uh, places in the Northeast which evacuated. I mean, Gahati was one, Impal was another. So there were lots of places that, that uh, you know, where widespread evacuation took place uh, in the Northeast as well. Any other questions? Again, just to Mukuntu so that I balance this out. Yes, sir, in the green shirt in the back. Yeah, uh, he Thank you. Um, I have a question beyond what was happening around India, more from a Japanese point of view. Uh, reflecting on the Second World War outcome, would we say that the Japanese were more distracted looking at China, Russia, getting into India since from the Southeast Asia, than looking at how to defend against the US, which I think they decisively lost against. <laughs> well, you know, the Japanese never wanted to scrap with the US. The Japanese only wanted to neutralize uh, uh, the US Navy. Uh, you must remember, I think uh, Vishnu knows this better than me, but, you know, Japan had a basically uh, an air force that was naval based, yeah? And uh, so they wanted to take out uh, the U.S. Army in, in Pearl Harbor so that they could uh, 
uh, get their reserves from uh, tin and rubber and other ne material necessary to fuel their war in China uh, from Southeast Asia. Because the US had, 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 had an embargo. You know, they, they stopped selling steel, they stopped selling uh, petrol, they stopped selling resources uh, that the Japanese uh, needed, and the Japanese war effort needed. So basically, uh, Japan's scrap was never with the US. I mean, we Pearl Harbor, as I keep saying in the book, may have been the international headline, but uh, Pearl Harbor was only insurance. You know, Southeast Asia was the prize. That's what they really wanted. And so uh, I think from a Japanese perspective, uh, really uh, Southeast Asia was much, much more important than, you know, Pearl Harbor, which has been the stuff of countless books and countless movies. Uh, really, this is what they, what they wanted here. They didn't want to come to India, at least at that time. They only wanted to create a certain degree of havoc in India and, of course, use the INA, which they did uh, quite effectively for a while. Well, I'd like to thank uh, both our authors very much. And it is just fascinating that uh, the entire Eastern frontier, as it were, what goes around comes around in history, is now so active. When we talk about Burma, and we didn't really get into the Burma angle at all, uh, both authors have actually written uh, about that in their books. Uh, it is active now. There are threats, concerns. The entire geostrategic space on the east of our country is so very important. It all happened several times in the past as well. I'd like to thank all of you so much for coming to this session. Thank you. Oh,